any inflammation in the body turns on brain inflammation, whether it's chemical exposures, food reactions, and inflammatory disease. All those things tend to turn on uh, the inflammatory cascade in the brain. First of all, it's really important to understand that that two thirds of the brain are actually immune cells, which tells you how important neuroinflammation is to the brain. So the, the brain itself is really made of neurons and glial cells. And glial cells are immune cells, and we usually think of the brain as being all these neurons, but it's actually all these immune cells. So most of the chronic neurodegenerative diseases of our time are really a consequence of neuroinflammation and immunological activity. But when you look at the brain, it has different lobes, and each lobe has its own function. And I think when you look at different neurodegenerative diseases, a lot of times people just tend to think I have to have multiple sclerosis or full-blown dementia to have disease. But when people start to have neurodegeneration, they have consequences depending on which lobe is being involved with their degeneration. So the frontal lobe, if we start from the front and go all the way back with the brain, the frontal lobe is really involved with executive function, planning, coordination, motivation. So you know when the frontal lobe starts to degenerate, people will lose their motivation. People will lose their decision-making. People will lose their timelining. So they're always late to events and they can't plan on things and they don't want to do anything else in life and they really lose all motivation and drive. If you go back a little bit further, you get the areas of the premotor areas and the premotor areas are really involved with motor planning and coordination. So those areas of the brain start to degenerate. People start to not be as good with sports they used to play. And, and then if you go a little bit further back, you hit the parietal lobe and the parietal lobe is involved with what they call uh, somatic sensation. It's just your sense of feeling where your joints and limbs are. And when that starts to start to degenerate, people may be more prone to muscle injuries and ankle sprains and because they just can't sense where their body is. And then as you get to the back of the brain, you have your occipital lobe. And as that area of the brain starts to degenerate, you lose your blind spot or visual field. You're more prone to miss balls if you play tennis or get in car accidents because you don't see one side of your field as well. And those things may not be obvious to you. And if you look at the brain from top down, as you go from the cortex down, you get to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is really involved with your sense of posture and your control of movement and coordination. And when those things become impaired, you can um, lose your endurance for standing for a long period of time or lose your balance if you're going downstairs. So one of the things that happens in a neurodegenerative model is people actually don't always develop a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's or dementia. They start to have degeneration in local areas of their brain. <laughs> And then as those areas of the brain degenerate, they tend to lose function. And most people obviously blame that on aging, but it's really neurodegeneration. So the most common sign of brain inflammation is really um, slowness in function in general. So if we talk about cognitive function or recall or mental focus and concentration, um, we tend to, tend to see it slow down. So one of the things people commonly use is the term brain fog. They just can't find the word that they're speaking of. So inflammation, what it does to the brain and to neurons is that it slows down what's called nerve conductance. So nerve conductance is how fast neurons fire from one neuron to the next. So when a neuron is inflamed, the speed of nerve conductance goes down. And the most common symptom of neuroinflammation, especially in the frontal lobe, is people just have a hard time finding their words or they feel their brain is slow that day. And then unfortunately, um, for some people, that becomes an everyday routine type of event. Now, sometimes we've all, I think, experienced having a sluggish brain. There's days when we're like, we're not functioning that day or something. Those are probably days where there's some degree of excess neuroinflammation that's taking place or something that's impacting brain bioenergetics. So the target site for inflammation isn't really a specific lobe of the brain. There are cells called glial cells. And glial cells, like I said before, are found throughout the entire brain. Um, and the goal is really to try to dampen the messenger pathways that activate the glial cells. And what the research is really showing is that it's really systemic inflammation, that any inflammation in the body turns on brain inflammation. And for people that have like chronic inflammatory diseases, like if they have irritable bowel syndrome or some type of autoimmune disease, that chronic inflammation releases inflammatory messengers and they actually turn on brain inflammation. So when you look at brain inflammation, it's really susceptible to any, anything that triggers an inflammatory response, whether it's chemical exposures, food reactions, an inflammatory disease, um, uh, blood sugar elevations like diabetes, all those things tend to turn on uh, the inflammatory cascade in the brain. Well, for the most part, when you look at statistics for all types of neurodegenerative diseases, they're all on the rise for the most part. And we know that all developmental disorders are on the rise. And if you look at childhood developmental disorders, I mean, there's some stats that are saying that one out of eight children in the US have some type of developmental delay, whether it's dyslexia or autism or attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder. So it's really, it's really an epidemic and it's really growing and we're not really doing anything to change that. I mean, really we're not, we're actually creating this environment today where we have inflammatory foods as a normal part of our diet. We have a high level exposure to chemicals that are not being tested and they're being used in everyday products. 
and we have all these various factors that are then turning on inflammatory diseases that are then impacting the brain. When you're looking at neurodegeneration for yourself, the first question to really ask yourself is, what have you noticed change in the past five years or 10 years? Now remember, neurodegeneration can happen slowly or it can happen quickly, right? So one of the things you can look at, uh, for example, is your handwriting. How's your handwriting? Has it changed over the years? Has it become worse? You can look at your handwriting from a few years ago. Now, if that's become worse, then the areas of your motor cortex and basal ganglia and premotor strip are starting to degenerate. So that's one finding. Um, if, you've any, if you've noticed that you've become worse, for example, with uh, making appointments or being motivated, those are all frontal. Uh, if your balance has gotten worse and you have to ha hold on handrails and you have to be very control, be very uh, conscious of where you're stepping and, and uh, your balance, those are associated with cerebellum degeneration. So, you know, there's a saying in functional neurology rehabilitation is you find out what's not working and you have the person do that. So for the most part, you have to ask yourself, is your memory declining? Is your focus and concentration declining? Is your balance declining? Yeah, those are all the key things. Now, unfortunately, a lot of things are hard to pick up on your own that you really sometimes have to have an exam to pinpoint if you can discriminate if some things are not working for you or are working for you, right? So neurotransmitters are neurochemicals that allow neurons to synapse and communicate with each other. Um, there's, the four main neurotransmitters are dopamine, acetylcholine, uh, serotonin, and GABA. Now dopamine is the main motivation neurotransmitter. And um, your ability to want to do things and to be excited to do things and to, to push yourself to do things associated with, with, with dopamine. So the person who can never finish tasks or even initiate tasks, um, those are patterns of low dopamine activity. Now. If you look at all the research, one of the most profound ways to raise dopamine is physical activity. <laughs> so when people exercise, their, their brain gets flooded with dopamine. Now, you have to have the initial motivation to start, but if that pathway gets started, then you can really flood the brain with dopamine. The other main neurotransmitter is um, serotonin. And serotonin is really involved with your, in a sense, your sense of mood is strongly involved with serotonin. I'm, and I also, please realize, I'm making very gener strong generalizations for all these neurotransmitters. But people that typically have low serotonin, they just, nothing really brings them joy. So it's not that they're depressed necessarily, it's just that the things that would normally make them happy are no longer making them happy, right? So they don't really have a favorite song anymore, or they don't have a favorite food or a favorite TV show, everything is just, there, but nothing really excites them. And then when you look at the other main neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, that's your memory neurotransmitter. So your ability to recall things in your life and to find words and to uh, remember events, uh, to have photographic memory, those are all involved with acetylcholine. And then GABA is the calming down inhibitory neurotransmitter. So that allows you, if GABA levels are imbalanced, you may have things like anxiety um, as, a, as a key thing or restless mind. So those are the most common patterns with those four common neurotransmitters. First of all, the research is showing BPA is the key uh, chemical found in plastic products like plastic bottles or plastic utensils. And BPA-free research is showing is much worse. It's much more inflammatory. So it's probably better not to even use BPA-free stuff <laughs> if you can. So. You know, we are, I'm doing a lot of research right now with chemicals and how it impacts brain autoimmunity. And the chemicals we're, we're looking at are not really considered toxic. Because <laughs> usually when you use the word toxic, you're thinking about things like mercury or lead that are known to be toxins or are classified as toxins. But everyday products like uh, uh, TBBPA, fire retardants, or formaldehyde, or isocyanates, or bisphenol A, they're found in everywhere. They're found, formaldehyde's found in the carpets, um, uh, uh, fire retardants are found in all your furniture if you live in the U.S. And those chemicals um, are not classified as toxins, but they may be a factor in causing a degree of neuroinflammation. So some of the research that uh, I've done with my colleagues, Dr. Risto Vijdani and Dr. Martha Herbert, uh, and that we've been publishing on, is really understanding that chemicals actually bind to our own human proteins. So in our research, we measured chemicals binding to albumin, and then that creates what's called a neoantigen, a new antigen, and that triggers an antibody response. And that antibody response has now been linked in some of our research with antibodies to, to brain tissues. So we did research where we found BPA antibodies, um, so people that react to plastic foods, they have very high levels of myelin antibodies. So when you do research, you do statistical analysis. So statistical analysis for these things were what they call a p-value, which is 
the probability that's maybe due to chance if that what they call the null hypothesis is true. But our p-value was 0 0.001, so very statistically significant, so it's not due to chance, very unlikely due to chance. And we do something called the R value for correlation. If the core R value is one, that means there's one to one correlation. So if one goes up, the other goes up. So in our research with BPA and antibodies to the brain, we're finding correlation values of almost one, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. So if one goes up, the other goes up. And we've also calculated what are called risk ratios. So if you make antibodies to plastic compounds, your risk for having neurological antibodies are sometimes 10 times the risk. Not twice, but 10 times, some, some of them even higher, depending on which markers we're looking at. So we tend to think that a lot of the things in our environment are safe, but they're really not. So BPA being one of the key ones. Now, research done on BPA has found that 90% of the population has high amounts of BPA in their urine. And there's studies that also show things like TB BPA, like fire retardants. They're found in 90% of females breastfeeding in breast milk. So these are very prevalent, but not everyone reacts against them. So exposure alone isn't the only factor, but when you lose your tolerance to these chemicals and you start to make antibodies against them, you start to react against them, there's a high degree of neuroinflammation. Now in our research, we didn't check um, patients with autoimmune disease. We checked blood samples from the healthy population. So there's, a, so there's a high degree of underlying brain inflammation in the population that potentially may be triggered by chemicals that is not associated with a specific neurological disease, which is really scary. So I don't think limiting the exposure is the only answer, but it is part of it. So for example, if you have antibodies to BPA because you're reacting against plastics, that means uh, you've lost what's called chemical tolerance. So our immune systems uh, have some degree of tolerance. So some people, as they get older, they become intolerant to smells or to lotions or different things. Um, but at the same time, you can be intolerant to different chemicals as you get exposed to them. When you lose your chemical tolerance, which many people do with autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammatory conditions, then everyday chemical exposures can be triggers. And then you might want to reduce your load. So for BPA, uh, being one of the most common exposures, you know, we tell patients, listen, don't drink out of a coffee lid because when they drink out of a coffee lid, that hot water releases the BPA in their, in their fluids. <laughs> Don't microwave your food in plastics. That really increases the BPA load. Um, so those are things we can try to do, but at the end of the day, the bigger picture is what's causing loss of chemical tolerance in people, and that goes back to the neuroinflammatory question in general. At the end of the day, all of us are playing with this game of how much neurodegeneration we get, which neurons die off and degenerate, versus how much neuroplasticity we develop which is neurons connecting with each other. So in, in any sense, when you look at dementia, you have various triggers that cause people to have more neurodegeneration than neuroplasticity, so their function goes down. In a clinical model, if you see someone who's suffering from things like dementia or cognitive decline or any type of various neurological disorder, you're trying to go, how do we switch it? How do we get them to develop more neuroplasticity and then remove all the things that are causing neurodegeneration, right? Um, so I think dementia is, is definitely something that happens to people as we get older because, of, because most people have more neuroinflammatory mechanisms than they have mechanisms to develop neuroplasticity. And the goal is to try to switch that. Neuroplasticity can be activated uh, by using your brain, but specifically. So for example, I'll give you an example. If you were, for example, a kid who wasn't good at sports and you never played sports, then the area of your brain, the cerebellum and motor areas would never develop well, right? So then you can develop through life with having a part of your brain called the cerebellum not really having a lot of plasticity because you never developed it, right? And then you get older and you were, let's say, as an uncoordinated child, your arms were flying all over the place and you became older and now you're, you know, considered grown out of it. Uh, and that's not as prominent, but as life happens and you get inflammatory exposures and you have food sensitivities and you get environmental triggers, maybe you get a traumatic brain injury, uh, maybe you have some diabetes, maybe you're a smoker, as all those factors add up and your glial cells turn on, you get this inflammatory cascade in the brain, then the entire brain in itself has this inflammatory response. And areas of the brain that have the least amount of plasticity to develop will be the first ones that show clinical signs. So now you're back to being uncoordinated. <laughs> And now you have balance problems and, you know, and then usually those patients go in and see their doctor and go, yeah, my balance has really gotten worse, but I've always had bad balance, I've always had bad coordination. And if you really do the history, that's not true. They had it when they were a child, they've kind of grown through it. And then as their brain's neurodegenerated, there's the brain that didn't have much plasticity compared to other regions are the ones that show up.
you want to basically figure out what areas of the, the brain are involved and then try to do things to activate those areas. Now, we, did th we tend to think that all brain degeneration is your, your ability to recall and focus and concentrate and think, but that's only the frontal cortex, right? So different areas of the brain can generate and they cause different symptoms. When input to the vagus starts to degenerate, people have chronic constipation and motility issues, right? When areas of the temporal lobe start to degenerate, people can't discriminate sounds when they're in a the room. If anything is going on, they can't hear <laughs> They can't hear the speaker or hear what's going on on TV if there's any background noise. Um, when people have their occipital lobe degenerate, things aren't as bright when they compare when they compare it to other people. So, um, you know, neurodegeneration is very specific to different areas of the brain, and then those are the symptoms that have to be identified. So there's this tends to be this evaluation of cognition, but cognition is only one region of the brain that's susceptible. The first book I wrote was on thyroid and Hashimoto's disease. And I wanted to add a part two to my book, which is why I wrote a book on the brain, but it was really for my Hashimoto readers. Now, people that have hypothyroidism, for the most part, 90% of them or higher according to research, their underlying cause is they have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease. They have antibodies to their thyroid gland, and that's why it's being destroyed, okay? So it actually is an autoimmune disease, but most patients don't know that. Most patients get diagnosed that they have hypothyroid, they're told it's a genetic endocrine disorder, and that's it. And that's partly true, but in reality, the genetic disorder is turning on an autoimmune mechanism that is now making antibodies called TPO, which attach to the thyroid gland and destroy it. Well, research is showing that TPO antibodies have uh, amino acid homology, or they have the potential for molecular mimicry, that the antibodies against the thyroid can actually attach to the brain. <laughs> and when those antibodies attach to the brain, then immune cells destroy them. So when someone has an autoimmune disease for the thyroid and they make antibodies called TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, those antibodies not only attach to the thyroid gland, which then signals inflammatory destruction of those tissues, they also attach to the brain. And if this happens very acutely, very aggressively, they call it thyroid encephalopathy, but it, many people have it at a very subtle degree. Also, researchers have found that when people are thyroid hormone deficient, maybe they're not taking their thyroid hormones or it took years for them to get diagnosed, that being thyroid hormone deficient turns on brain inflammation. <laughs> so the glial cells get activated. So the longer it takes to get diagnosed, the more brain inflammation you have. And the autoimmunity itself for being hypothyroid turns on, turns on brain degeneration. Now, most of the people that have hypothyroidism Hashimoto's have some degree of HLA-DQ genotypes for gluten sensitivity, or not always celiac disease, but gluten sensitivity. And there's also lots of strong research that shows gluten antibodies attached to brain target sites. And we published a study four years ago. We looked at 400 healthy blood donors in the US and we measure their antibodies to wheat protein and milk protein. And we found that there was actually close to 15% of the population that had antibodies to different uh, proteins associated with casein and gluten, right? And of those, we found half of them had brain antibodies. So the Hashimoto's hypothyroid person is very genetically susceptible to gluten and wheat. So when you add in their antibodies for the thyroid attached to the brain and, and being thyroid hormone deficient turns on brain inflammation and many of them have gluten intolerances and that turns on brain degeneration, brain inflammation, we see that. Now in my clinical practice, we see, I would say about a third of my thyroid patients also have brain antibodies. So one of the ways to look for neurological autoimmune disease is you check antibodies for the brain. So these are like myelin basic protein, myelin oligodendrocytic protein, neurofilament protein. So what we're finding is that, yeah, about a third of the patients we're seeing um, in a private practice, got mind just not a research study, they have autoimmunity to their brain, but it's not necessarily multiple sclerosis. It's just a subtle neuroinflammatory autoimmune disease. When we see a lot of chronic patients have hypothyroidism, their chief complaints are depression, and fatigue, and most of that is brain-based in some of these patients. Because as their brain gets inflamed, they can't activate their brain, so they have depression. Their fatigue is really brain-based because they have no, no need to do anything, and everything they do activates their brain. So their exhaustion and depression is really all brain, it has not, nothing to do with the thyroid. So when they spend all this time trying to figure out the right thyroid medication dosage, they're usually unsuccessful because they haven't really addressed their brain autoimmunity or their autoimmunity in general. So not all food intolerances relate to inflammation in the brain. So when you look at the food foods uh, and food reactions, you don't actually react against the entire protein of foods. So if you look at uh, 
a food protein, a prote uh, each food protein has an amino acid sequence. So when you make antibodies to a food protein, um, you only have a portion of that amino acid chain that has a sequence that the antibody is attaching to. Okay? So there's a concept uh, in immunology called molecular mimicry. So if you have the same amino acid sequence of certain foods to a target protein tissue, like brain, like myelin, then you can have cross-reactivity. So gluten has gotten a lot of the attention with research recently. There's actually a neurological disease called gluten ataxia. So uh, neuroscientists have been spending a lot of time researching food connections between uh, cerebellar degenerative disease and that, and gluten. And the amino acid sequence of gluten has similar amino acid sequences to what are called Purkinje cells in the brain. So again, when they eat the anti, when they get exposed to the protein, make the antibody, that antibody can bind to tissues in the brain. And that creates a devastating neuroinflammatory response. So not all foods have this. Now we did some recent research where we purified 200 uh, uh, proteins and uh, we took what are called monoclonal antibodies. Those are pure antibodies with purified proteins to look for molecular mimicry. And we've identified a list of foods that we're, we have in publication or in submission right now were or specific to different target sites of neurological diseases. In the future, what we'll see is certain proteins, uh, certain food proteins are specific to certain neurological target sites. Aquaporin is things that are found in soy and spinach and tomato, they're a protein sequence. And that has been shown to have very strong correlation. People have what's called neuromyelitis optica, which is a form of MS that involves the brain and spinal cord. And those food proteins can trigger that disease specifically, but not gluten or dairy or other things. So food proteins are gonna be very uh, specifically associated with uh, which target site their autoimmune diseases. Digital dementia is, is basically when you use technology and you avoid using your brain. So like, you don't have to memorize phone numbers anymore. So word recall or number recall is not being activated by the brain. So those areas of the brain, especially in the left, inferior parietal temporal areas start to, re to degenerate. So whatever you're using technology for starts to start to cause degeneration. So I'll give an example. In a clinical setting, we'll have patients, for example, uh, we, we evaluate what's called dyscalculi, see if they can count backwards from 100 with sevens. So you have to start with 100 and then 93 and go all the way down to zero. So many times when patients have dyscalculi, which is really common, um, uh, we'll just have them like take their phone and start memorizing all their phone numbers. <laughs> and then we teach them to start dialing their phone numbers instead of just pushing the patient's name. And that's actually a form of brain therapy because as they activate that region of the brain, they develop plasticity and connectivity and it has far reaching impacts in other cognitive aspects of their everyday life. Everyone is specific to their own brains and everyone can have different degrees of neurodegeneration. Now, let's say you were a person who hated math growing up and you never, you avoided math at all cost. So what does that do? That means as your brain develops, you don't develop enough plasticity and connections in the areas of your brain that are associated with numbers and calculations, which is the left inferior parietal and left temporal. So if that's the area of your brain that you've never really developed through your evolution of a human being, then as you get neuroinflammation, that's the first place to show up. So then, yeah, if you're that person, then, then math and numbers would be important for you. But if that area of your brain is healthy for you, it's not the same thing. The brain needs three things. It needs stimulation, it needs glucose, it needs oxygen. And we assume that the brain's getting oxygen because we're breathing, but that's not necessarily accurate. So our brain oxygen potential is really, first of all, dependent upon our circulation. So if people have really cold hands and cold feet, they have white nail beds, that means they have very poor circulation. So poor circulation impacts brain function. And usually those types of people really notice the biggest change in the brain when they exercise. Right? Because they exercise, they get their heart rate up, they get blood flow, they get circulation. All of a sudden they're like, hey, I can really think again. I can really focus. Um, so poor circulation is, is a major issue of getting what we call cerebral hypoxia, not getting enough blame, not, not enough oxygen to the brain. Another thing is just blood pressure. Um, so blood pressure, um, that low blood pressure, for example, is a problem for brain health to some degree. Because low blood pressure, like normal blood pressure is 120 or 80. So if you get you know in the ranges of like 100, below 100, over 70 or something like that, um, that can actually impact your blood flow to your brain. So people that just have very low blood pressure don't have what they call enough perfusion. They can't push oxygen and blood into the brain. So if you have low blood pressure, if you have poor circulation, those things start to show up. Most common signs of having really poor circulation is having uh, like white toenails, cold feet, cold hands. Some people that have really bad circulation end up getting fungal nail growth. 
uh, those fungal nail growths happen because the, the blood flow can't carry natural killer cells and immune cells to their toes, so the fungus overgrows. Uh, those are all red flags. And in those cases, you, you know, the strategy should be looking at things to improve your circulation and your blood flow. Regular exercise is one of those things. There's lots of natural botanicals that can improve circulation and blood flow. But that's a critical thing, trying to make sure you have enough oxygen to your brain. Also, it's important to note that if you can't get blood flow to your brain, you can't carry any nutrients to your brain either. So in a clinical model, if people have poor circulation and don't have proper blood flow to the brain, they can take all the different nutrients like essential fatty acids and fish oils and <laughs> all these amino acids, but it has very little effect clinically because they can't get it delivered to the brain properly. <laughs> So it's a big deal for us when we look at clinical mechanisms and we look at a person's circulation. But the first approach when someone comes in and, and has any types of dysfunctional brain symptoms is to do a complete neurological exam head to toe, right? So we evaluate frontal lobe and prefrontal and parietal and occipital and cerebellar and midline and lateral cerebellum and brain stem and go all the way down and try to find out what areas are not functioning well. If the areas are not functioning well, what we do is we activate them. So for example, if the temporal lobe is not firing well on the left, we do repetitive music and tapping. If it's right, we play, have and listen to jazz or different types of things. Just from functional MRI studies, we know um, which areas of the brain are activated by specific regions. So the goal of the exam is to find these. Now in a traditional neurological exam, that's not what you do. In a traditional neurological exam, you look for a disease and then there's really no treatment for it, <laughs> you get labeled. But in a neurodegenerative model, you do a complete neurological exam and find what are called soft neurological signs, areas where they're not doing as well with uh, in their examination, and then try to do therapy for that, right? But very simply, whatever they can't do is what they would do. So if the balance is bad, they work on their balance. If their <laughs> word recall is bad, they work on word recall. And then the goal from a nutritional point of view um, is to look at the priorities we have, which is things like glucose, oxygen, and stimulation. So we wanna make sure the blood sugars are stable, they're not hypoglycemic, they're not insulin resistant, that uh, they're getting proper blood flow to the brain, that they're not anemic. So it really is a complete workup. It, it generally takes me four hours to evaluate a new patient. And we take them through EKGs and uh, spirometric testing and do complete blood work and do a complete neuro exam, and then sit back and go, okay, what are the things we can do that can impact most, as many symptoms as possible to make a difference? So for example, if someone's anemic, that's our first treatment for the brain because they have to have red blood cells carry oxygen to the brain, right? We can't do brain therapy exercises because it can't work if they have no oxygen going to their brain. Someone else may come in, they're not anemic, they just need to activate their frontal cortex. So we may do eye movements or different types of things to activate plasticity there. So that's our approach. The top tips for neuroplasticity, number one is you have to get sleep. Number two, you have to do some degree of physical exercise. And with physical exercise, the research is showing that the key thing that it releases is something called BDNF. And it doesn't have to be for long periods of time, but it has to be high intensity. So the higher the intensity of the exercise, the more BDNF you release in your brain, that encourages the growth of neurons. So a lot of times I'll just have my patients um, do what's called a seven minute workout or something. And if they can get their heart rate up just for a few minutes, that completely changes their brain chemistry. <laughs> and then the other things are do whatever you're bad at. And this is not the trend for what people like to do. So <laughs> people like to do what they're good at, right? And as a kid, as you're good at some things, you get encouraged to do them, and then you don't do the things you're bad at. So whatever you're bad at, you need to do. So if you hate learning a language, you gotta go learn a language. If you hate art, guess what you have to do? You gotta do art. <laughs> so that's the best way to develop uh, neuroplasticity. The whole field of functional medicine came out of the field of psychiatry with Abraham Hoffer's discovery that you could treat schizophrenia yeah. you know, using nutrients and helping to improve the biochemistry of the brain. And then Linus Pauling wrote his seminal paper, Orthomolecular Psychiatry in Science Magazine in 1969, which talked about the perspective of how do you straighten molecules? In other words, how do you correct the imbalances or dysfunctions in your biochemistry? Yep. Uh, it's called orthomolecular, which means to straighten. And that has really led to the whole field of functional medicine. And we then sort of expanded on that with our understanding of the role of inflammation in the brain, and I, and I, you know, many schizophrenic patients have high levels of, for example, gluten antibodies. About 20% of schizophrenics have anti-gliden antibodies in their bloodstream. Yep. Uh, when you take the gluten away, they do better. That causes brain inflammation. And when you yep. do autopsy studies on people with Alzheimer's or autism or schizophrenia or depression, you find that their brains are inflamed. So, yep. uh, you know, when you start to think about that, it's like, wait a minute, we are treating this completely incorrectly. And this is what was classical of traditional medicine. You treat the symptoms, not the cause. And functional medicine is really about the cause and why, not just what disease you have, but why do you have it? And, and in the case of 
these brain disorders, uh, it's often not obvious. Uh, and the problem may be far away from the brain. It might be in the gut or it might be in your diet or it might be a toxin or it might be an infection and, and or it might be mold and, and it might be all sorts of things that we are kind of missing the boat on. And so we have this potential to sort of rethink our whole approach to brain science. That's what's so exciting when we see you know, the work of guys like Dale Bredesen or others uh, and nutritional psychiatrists like those at Harvard and metabolic psychiatrists at, at Stanford. They're doing work in this field, understanding the connection between the brain and some of these systemic processes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you, when, you, when you take a schizophrenic um, and you look at them with a PET scan, the positive emission tomography, what you'll see is their brain lights up. And that's because their microglia, which is their immune cells in the brain, are on, literally on fire. And unless you actually treat that, uh, the, a schizophrenic is at high risk for developing dementia down the road because their fire is not being put out. And this mark is, I'm going to mention this because I, when I was, I, I actually do, uh, I've, I've done uh, some lectures uh, for uh, American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine on neuroinflammation. And in the process of preparing for that, I came up against some really fascinating things. One is that when you look at the genetics of schizophrenia, mm. um, there's, uh, they, they did this whole genome-wide association studies of saying, well, what gene or what genes are associated with schizophrenia, and they did what's called a Manhattan plat, plot. And on chromosome six, um, it, it sort of stood out like a, a, a the you know the uh, Empire State Building. And what they found mm -hmm. out is that on chromosome six, chromosome six is highly involved with the immune system. So that tells us that a lot of patients who have schizophrenia have an issue on chromosome six related to the immune system. And what I'm going to tell you next is absolutely positively fascinating, and, and this sort of blew me away. Um, there are two case reports, and remember, case reports are just like a doctor observing, okay, this is interesting, look what happened, you know, why did this happen? And the two case reports were this, um, and this tells you, you know, how the immune system is intimately involved in schizophrenia. One is a patient had refractory schizophrenia and developed some type of uh, cancer and needed a bone marrow transplant. The refractory patient with schizophrenia got a bone marrow transplant. Well, a bone marrow transplant is basically giving you a new immune system. After he got the bone marrow transplant, guess what happened to his refractory schizophrenia? It was gone. What happened? Gone. Wow. It, it completely cleared up because it changed his immune response to whatever it was responding to. I don't know. But his, his refractory schizophrenia went away. On the flip side, there was another uh, gentleman who also needed a bone marrow transplant. He got his bone marrow from his brother who had schizophrenia. Guess what happened to him? Mm. He caught he, he quote, got schizophrenia. Caught schizophrenia. He got schizophrenia. <laughs> wow, it goes both that's ways. Pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. So yeah, that's it is amazing. amazing. I, I was I was blown away by that, and I think that you know in, in you know people who are doing I'm you know I'm a clinician. I'm seeing patients, but the you know, those those case reports are really really seminal to change how we think about how we see these conditions. And mm. the fact that that can happen, I also found it fascinating that, you know, uh, we, we talk about the gut microbiome and how that's so important related to the immune system is that when you do stool transplants, you can literally uh, transplant or infect a person and make them skinny, or you can transplant right. stool and make them fat. You can go well, both ways. Autism and we don't Parkinson's, fully... right? They're, they're actually doing fecal transplants yes. with autism and with Parkinson's and seeing real changes in exactly. the brain function. That blows my mind when you think about that. It does. It does blow my mind. And and the thing about this is we are still in the nascent uh, uh, period of really understanding this because it's not like you know you take this one chemical or you take this one probiotic and everything's fixed. It's a very very complex uh, array. And you know we have hundreds of different microbes and bacteria and viruses in the gut. So it's going to take us a while to figure this all out. But, you know, with, I think we're also in a, in a very good uh, stage where, you know, we have, um, you know, massive computing power and we have artificial intelligence. And I think that we're going to probably uh, approach these areas of understanding neuroinflammation and really difficult to treat conditions like ALS, like uh, schizophrenia, like uh, Parkinson's and such. And we're going to be able to uh, biohack them. And, 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 and Alzheimer's, right, Alzheimer's. Now, that's another yeah. thing. Now, this is, <laughs> you're bringing up one of, my, one of my favorite things. So for years, Mark, what, what, did, what did neurology focus on with Alzheimer's? It was what? It was amyloid, amyloid plaque, amyloid. right? Yeah. Amyloid plaque is 
All you got to do is get rid of the amyloid and you get rid yeah. of, car- of of Alzheimer's. That's right. So, that didn't so work you out get rid so of well. cholesterol <laughs> and you get rid of heart disease. Right. Yeah. So guess guess what? Uh, 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 the, the plaque, the, the beta amyloid plaque that was found in the brain, guess what that actually is? That's an antimicrobial peptide. The brain is wow. producing beta amyloid in response to some type of organism, be it a virus, a bacteria, or a fungus. So when we see that, those are the footprints of a organism that the body is trying to uh, uh, attack. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we actually probably should have Rudy Tanzi on the podcast. He's a scientist at Harvard who specializes oh, really? in Alzheimer's. And he has discovered the microbiome yes. of the brain. So literally there are yes. viruses, yeah. yeast, bacteria in the brain, which we thought was sterile that may be triggering this cascade of inflammation. And then the question is, where does this come from? And it seems like a lot of it may come from the gut, which is crazy. How does it get from your gut to your brain? But it does, and it triggers this sort of neuroinflammation that's driving things like Alzheimer's. You know, I think I think we often get stuck on one thing, though, right? In, in medicine, we stuck, it's stuck on it's this or it's that. And, and I think the important thing people remember is whatever your diagnosis is, it doesn't immediately tell you what the cause is. So you could have 10 people with Alzheimer's, they could have 10 different causes. Right. Um, and in one person, you could have yep. three or four or five different causes, right? And I, I just remember one patient I had who was seven years old, really pretty significant, um, you know, Alzheimer's, not not bedridden at this point, but pretty non-functional, also depression, and was struggling really badly. He was former CEO of his company, a family-run business, couldn't function anymore. Behavior was changing. His kids, grandkids, family didn't want to hang out with him anymore because he was acting inappropriate. And it uh, turned out he had so many things going on. I mean, the, the biggest thing he had was high mercury, yeah. which he lived in Pittsburgh and had exposed to the, all the, the steel plants. And they used coal ash for fertilizing land. And they put it on the streets in the winter instead of sort of uh, salt for the icy roads. And he also had a mouthful of fillings. And he also had a terrible history of irritable bowel for 30 years and was on stelazine, which is just like an antipsychotic. So it's like a relaxant for your gut, which is terrible. But he had terrible <laughs> gut issues and bacterial overgrowth and leaky gut and gluten sensitivity. And he also had insulin resistance. He had prediabetes. So essentially, essentially he essentially had all these problems, heavy metals, microbiome issues, and he had insulin resistance or prediabetes, which we know drives inflammation in the brain. They're calling Alzheimer's, you know, often uh, type 3 diabetes. And he had all these other biochemical yep. issues uh, genetically, like methylation problems, and, and which are the B vitamins that were also driving inflammation in his brain because he wasn't able to produce antioxidants and glutathione. And when we started to address all these things, we got the mercury out, we fixed his gut, we cleaned up his diet, we got rid of the sugar and starch, we optimized his B vitamins. He literally came back from the dead like Rip Van Winkle. And was able to function, go back to work, wow. be a functioning member of his family again. And this is someone who would have just been said, okay, you have Alzheimer's and you are going to be in a nursing home. And that's the end of that. Uh, and it was pretty miraculous to see that. It sort of right. woke me up to how, by really being diligent with these patients, you can you can really help them either completely recover or dramatically recover. And I've seen, you know, the spectrum from, you know, in the tough cases of autism, Alzheimer's, you know, it depends how much they're, they've got going on how far down the road they are, but you see amazing stuff. But things like depression, bipolar disease, you know, a mood disorders, it's often remarkable how quickly the brain responds, ADD. Uh, and, and, and it's something that we just, um, you know, unfortunately are not thinking about that well in traditional medicine. And that's really why we do what we do at the Ultra Wellness Center. And we've treated nearly thousands and thousands of patients in this way. Uh, and we now do stuff virtually too, which is kind of fun. So we can see people from all over. And we have a great team of physicians and and nutritionists and practitioners who really help guide people through this this space. Because, you know, what kills me, Todd, and I'm sure it kills you, is you hear story after story, and I'm sure you get this all the time. Hey, could you help this one? Could you help that one? Or my mom or my dad or my sister or my friend. And 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 people are just struggling to find answers. And, you know, when you t- hear the story, you go, oh, God, I, I know what's wrong with this person. <laughs> but it's because we have a certain set of filters or lenses that we look at. And it's so gratifying. Can you think of any other cases that you want to share that sort of illustrate this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd mentioned this. This is a this is a fascinating case, and I, I really can't um, I can't a hundred percent prove it. But uh, I talked about it when we talked about the uh, the uh, oral systemic health connection is the connection with the mouth, and there's some really good evidence 
of uh, the particular bacterium, which is a bad actor, and um, it's called Porphyromonas gingivalis. And I have seen this in a number of patients who um, have had uh, early Alzheimer type symptoms. You can also see this oral bacteria in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so looking for this uh, with DNA of the mouth organisms. Um, and again, you know, this is, a, this is to me is a really fascinating thing. You know, somebody says, well, Alzheimer's runs in our family. Well, Porphyromonas gingivalis may run in your family. You may be spreading the bacteria from person to person. And this, this, uh, this bacteria, uh, which uh, is in, found in saliva, it stimulates the immune system and susceptible, genetically susceptible individuals and can really lead to uh, profound uh, uh, neuroinflammation. And in one patient in particular who I, uh, I saw, he had uh, Lewy body dementia, which is another form of you know, inflammation. They, Lewy bodies, because they on, on, on uh, 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 anatomical examination of the brain, they find these little things and they call them Lewy bodies, right? It doesn't mean that they understand it. It's just Lewy found it and that's what they, they named Lewy body after Lewy. <laughs> and, and, when I, when I, when I, and that's actually what, uh, that actually is what um, uh, Robin Williams had. Ro Robin Williams had Lewy body dementia with yes. Parkinson's. Yeah. You know, so we call it we call it Parkinson's. We put it in this neat little category and then we call it Alzheimer's or we call it dementia. We put it in this little category and then we call it Lewy body. And there are all sort of this interacting, overlapping kinds of things. And yeah, they can have different clinical presentations. But as you said, there can be many, many factors that go into uh, into uh, the uh, the origin of this neuroinflammatory process. Um, and diet plays a huge role. You know, if you don't have the right nutrients, you don't have the right fatty acids, um, you, you're, you're more going to be more prone to all of your cellular membranes have omega-3 fatty acids. If you're not able to make the, uh, compounds in the body, which are called pro resolving mediators or SPMs, um, um, mm. and actually have this mm. as a supplement now, um, th these are actually quite fascinating, um, uh, uh, compounds. The SPMs are, uh, sl a selective pro resolving mediator compounds. They're basically turbocharged fish oil and, uh, certain people, some people can't take the, their omega-3 fatty acids and turn them into these compounds. And uh, I, clinically, I have found them, they either work really well or they don't work. I don't know about you, Mark, but um, these are other uh, things that you can use as a, as a nutraceutical to help turn off inflammation in someone who's got uh, some chronic inflammation. Not to say if you take it, it's going to uh, help with uh, Alzheimer's per se, but it's one of the other tools that we can use to modulate the inflammatory response in the body. Yeah, so true. You know, we, we often in, in traditional medicine don't know how to evaluate the brain properly because we're just looking at the brain, but we have to look systemically. And that's really what we do in functional medicine. And, you know, Dale Bredesen coined the term a cognoscopy, <laughs> like a colonoscopy, but for your brain. And it's looking at all the things we've been talking about, looking at diet, looking at nutrient levels, looking at hormones, looking at toxins, at the microbiome in the gut, looking at infections, looking at mold, um, looking at allergens, looking at the overall health of the person and seeing what of those things are driving adverse consequences for the brain and for brain function. And in any individual, they yeah. may, the same cause might cause different things. So one person, it might cause schizophrenia, another person might cause Alzheimer's, another person might cause depression. So we, yep. we really have the tools to look at a true cognoscopy. And then, and then the question is, how do we help the brain repair? How do we set up the conditions for the brain repair? So let's talk about how, from a traditional functional medicine point of view, we actually treat these people. Because it's a pretty systematic approach that addresses diet and lifestyle and also some of these underlying causes. Yeah, I mean, so we, we as you mentioned, Mark, we do a lot of the testing. So we'll do organic acid testing, which is checking for uh, the uh, nutrient metabolites that are found in the body. We'll also do gut microbiome testing, looking at all of the different bacteria, viruses, yeast, uh, uh, parasites potentially in the body. Uh, we'll look at markers for leaky gut. Um, the other test that we'll, uh, I do is a leaky brain. You know, just like you can have leaky gut, you can have a leaky brain. There's actually a test for that. Cyrex Laboratories does the mm. blood brain barrier test. Uh, mm. You can check also for neuro, neuro autoimmune markers uh, with the Cyrex uh, 7X test. Uh, mm. Again, you can do uh, gut microbiome testing. Uh, the one that I like to use is the GI MAP test because I think it's it's quantitative PCR. So I, I find it to be very helpful. Um, the, I think the whole GI uh, realm area is, is an area that we're just learning. And there's going to, I think as time goes on, these tests are going to get better and better. But um, I find that to be uh, very, very helpful to distinguish what's going on uh, inside the, uh, the uh, person that I have. 
Um, the other thing, which I think is also really, really critical, Mark, uh, is sleep. And this is something that I really emphasize to people is that when our bodies sleep, our brains take out the garbage. OK, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. guarantee you when you have a patient who's got uh, a neurodegenerative condition, one of the first things that you'll see is disruptions of their sleep. And what happens is uh, during the day, you know, our brain only comprises 2% of our body weight, but it can it, it, um, it uses 20% of our body's energy, which means that there's a lot of metabolic activity. And what happens throughout the day is we get metabolic waste products that build up in the brain and our brain flushes them out during deep delta sleep. If we don't get that deep sleep, we can't flush the brain and take the garbage out uh, in the brain. And those toxins build up, those things that metabolic uh, byproducts, uh, fold, misfolded proteins, uh, uh, inflammatory molecules, uh, uh, amyloid, et cetera, build up in the brain and can uh, affect uh, how the, uh, uh, the person's uh, cognition is, their memory, their mood, et cetera. It's so, amazing. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the diet is such a huge role, too, in the brain. I mean, we see that the, the diet we're eating is a highly inflammatory diet in this country of processed foods, inflammation um, that are driven by sugar and starch, uh, excess refined oils, uh, all the lack of things that are anti-inflammatory, the whole foods with all the phytochemicals in them and the nutrient-dense foods. So we're eating a diet that's super inflammatory. So this is the first thing. And often dairy and gluten are among the worst um, and then, and then, and then we focus on how do we get the right nutrients? Because if you're low in certain nutrients, whether it's the antioxidant nutrients or the B vitamins, your body needs these nutrients to regulate your immune system to function, whether it's zinc or vitamin A or selenium or vitamin D, vitamin C, all these are really necessary for proper, uh, regulation of immune function. So getting adequate levels of these is key. Uh, also, we, we really get people on an elimination diet. If they if we suspect, or we test that they have sensitivities, to certain foods, we, treat the underlying infections if we find them with, with directly with antibiotics if we need to, or antivirals, or sometimes we'll use herbal therapies or things like ozone and other approaches to deal with infections. We'll fix the gut. Often that's a big issue. So we have a whole functional medicine approach to fixing the gut. We've talked about a lot on this podcast. And and then we'll address whatever to toxins that are there and help you eliminate the toxins through a really uh, focused detoxification program. And so building on, on the framework of functional medicine, we can identify in each individual which of these things are the problem, and then we can start to map the right treatments for that person. And it's, it's so gratifying when you see this in people's lifelong depression gets better. I mean, <laughs> there was a woman who was um, severely depressed, uh, who was uh, in and out of psychiatric hospitals on lots of medications. Her marriage was falling apart. She wasn't able to really work at, at, at work anymore. He's about to get fired from her job. Very overweight diet, obviously high in sugar, starch, and processed foods. And she did the Daniel Plan, which is a you know faith-based wellness program, but it's based on a whole foods, anti-inflammatory, vegan-ish diet essentially. And she said at the six-week reunion, she's like, Dr. Hyman, after three days of changing my diet, my depression went away. And I've been on piles of medications, in and out of hospitals, admitted for severe depression to hospitals many times in my life, and it's just gone. And I'm like, she goes, is that possible? I'm like, yeah, it's possible. If whatever you're eating was triggering the inflammation in your brain, you stopped it. Yes. So it's really uh, is sort of untapped reservoir of tools and tests and therapies that traditional medicine, psychiatry, neurology are just not using. And it's really where the money is. Well, and, and you bring up a really good point, Mark, because I, you know, I often uh, ask my patients who are seeing a psychiatrist and not, I'm not going to bash psychiatrists, but I think the profession of psychiatry is in the dark ages. Um, I can't remember the last time a psychiatrist that I've seen has done a blood test or examined the patient. And, uh, and I think that um, a lot of psychiatrists would actually do a good job if they actually uh, took a, a side course in neurology to really understand how the brain is working. So if you're a psychiatrist and you're seeing a patient and you are not utilizing a good nutritionist, preferably a functional medicine nutritionist, if you're not doing mm. some, uh, some uh, blood testing and you're not actually examining your patient, you may be doing more harm than good. Um, and it's not. And the other, the other, my, my other pet peeve about uh, 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 the psychiatric world is that we are now medicating uh, young children in ways that are unexplored. We're doing polypharmacy uh, in the young, polypharmacy in the old with these neuropsych drugs. They're advertised on television. And it is a complete, if you will, show. Excuse my French. It is awful. It's a, it's, a it's a terrible thing in this country 
And I, I, I'll stand up here and I'll, I'll shout from the, the rooftops because this is a bad thing that we're doing to the brains of our people, the brains of our young kids. This is something that we should not be doing, period. No, I mean, it's true. We, we really are you're relying on, on downstream treatments. So when the neurotransmitters go awry, whether it's depression or autism or Alzheimer's yeah. or ADD, it, you know, we go, well, how do we fix the neurotransmitters? And the question isn't how do we fix the neurotransmitters? The question is, why are the neurotransmitters so screwed up in the first place? <laughs> and it's because of these phenomena. And one of, one of the great examples I'll, I'll see is that the basic uh, driver of, of inflammation is diet. But there are other factors. And anything that causes inflammation can interfere with our enzyme function and, our, and, and throughout our bodies. And there's a key step in converting serotonin, I mean, uh, tryptophan into 5-hydroxytryptophan into serotonin, which is the happy mood chemical. Mm -hmm. And when you get a high level of inflammation in the body, the, the enzyme is sort of blocked and you end up with this byproduct called kinurate, or kin kinurate, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> I was read it, I don't know what I said. Uh, kinurinic acid, right. Yeah, kinurinic acid. And, and that level goes up and you can actually measure it in these patients. And you see when they have high levels of these quinolinate or kinurinic acid, it indicates inflammation. And you know that the serotonin pathway is being screwed up and it's bypassing it and producing these toxic molecules that cause inflammation in the brain. And, and so one, by getting rid of the inflammation, two, by giving the helpers for these chemical reactions, you can often really help improve the cognitive function of the brain. But it's really about the inflammation. And that's what's so, so different and striking about it. You know, it's interesting you, you say that, Mark, because I, um, I, I used to lecture um, uh, for a Metametrics laboratory who does the organic acid testing. I'll never forget when I first learned about uh, the quinolinic acid and that quinolinic acid is measured on organic acid testing. And this compound was actually first um, isolated in uh, patients who had AIDS dementia. And what they found is that, uh, as you mentioned, how that pathway gets switched over, uh, various uh, things like viruses, like the AIDS virus, can actually upregulate the production of quinolinic, quinolinic acid. And high levels of quinolinic acid cause the brain to become inflamed. They cause the brain to shrink, and they can potentially cause Alzheimer's or uh, uh, dementia-type uh, symptoms. And that's where uh, uh, AIDS dementia was, uh, uh, was basically how we found the importance of quinolinic acid. Now, I'll bet you there's not many psychiatrists who are measuring quinolinic acid in their, in their psych patients or even neurologists who are doing that. Yeah, we do. <laughs> At the Ultra Wellness Center, we definitely do. And we see so much yeah. from that data yeah. that can help us figure out how to help these patients. And that's, that's really what's to me so, so exciting. Well, you know, I also, this is, this is, I'm going to go back to when I went through my training because I went, uh, I trained at Dartmouth and I went, I had a great education at Dartmouth Medical School. And uh, one of my uh, neurology professors was uh, Dr. Alex Reeves, and he was a fantastic teacher and wonderful, open minded, energetic, enthusiastic guy. And he really helped me to understand how the brain works and also understand how it's connected to the mood and your whole being. And I also had, when I did my psychiatric training at Dartmouth, I had um, uh, another um, uh, 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 mentor who was board certified both in psychiatry and neurology. So that's where I really got, and he was someone who would actually order tests on patients and understand that, you know, let's, let's try to figure out what's going on. This was, you know, way before functional medicine was, uh, was uh, prominent. And it got my, um, my, uh, my, my own uh, brain thinking about, you know, uh, neuropsychiatry. And, and, and it's a fascinating field is there's, you can't split them. Neurology no. and psychiatry are one. And when you, yeah. only when you think that they're, uh, that they're separate are, you know, you have this dichotomy and you're, you're not going to, you're not going to help neurological patients and you're not going to help the psych patients. You need to think in neuropsychiatrically. Well, you know, I'm sure this happened to you like it happened to me, but, you know, I started practicing functional medicine. I wasn't focused on the brain. I wasn't focused on, you know, treating people by dealing with the, um, you know, the things that I, I, I thought were focused on the brain. I was really focused on fixing their health issues. People came in with irritable bowel or they came in with yeah. asthma or they came in with an autoimmune disease or they came in with whatever they came in with. And I would literally work on that problem. Um, so fix their gut or fix their, their, whatever was going on. Yeah. 
And, and, and incidentally, their psychiatric problems would get better or their, their ADD would get better. And they would report, Dr. Hyman, I'm not depressed anymore. My panic attacks are gone. My OCD is better. Uh, and, you know, my memory is better. I, I was like, well, what's going on here? And so I began to go, wait a minute. And I didn't really come at this from an academic point of view. I came at it from a clinical point of view. And I started noticing if you pay attention to your patients, you like listen to them, they'll actually tell you what's going on. I'm like, well, something's going on here. And that's really what led me to write the book, The Ultra Mind Solution, which is how to fix your broken brain by fixing your body first. And that book is a little dated now. But honestly, if I look back at it, I think it's still way ahead of its time, even now, because it's talking about the ideas that were, you know, then were, were in the literature, but just really beginning and stuff that I saw clinically, like the role of, for example, tick infections, the role of the gut microbiome. I mean, who's talking about the microbiome in the brain 15 years ago? Nobody. But, but we were paying attention to this and we saw these patients get better. And I was like, wow, this is a whole new field. So that's really why I wrote that book. And I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I got that book and it changed my life. I followed the directions. It's basically a step-by-step -step guide on how to fix your own brain. And, and sometimes you need the help of a doctor. And there's even sections in there on what to do if you, you need to go see a doctor and what tests you should ask for. But it's, it's really was uh, striking to me. And I remember this one patient came in after a while, after I'd written the book about a year later. And I said, oh, why are you here? So, well, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm like, well, what's going on? Well, you know, a while ago, I had all these uh, brain issues and depression and memory issues and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, why are you here then if you're better now? She says, well, I read your book. And I followed all the directions and I got better. It took nine months to get an appointment. <laughs> and I, I, I said, maybe you can help me get even better. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so what was so beautiful about it was that I literally took the, the science of what we do in functional medicine and applied it in a practical steps for people to do. And sometimes maybe people need to dig deeper. But I, I think it's, um, it's, such a, it's such a gratifying field that we're in, Todd, because we get to see how people really can transform by fixing the root causes, by looking at the underlying biology, by treating the system, not the symptoms, by helping deal with this brain on fire through looking at all the factors that, that can interfere with it. If you love that last video, you should check out the next one for sure on getting to the root cause of all disease. And hydration is really, really important because most of us walk around dehydrated. Most of us don't drink enough water. We have other fluids like sodas and juices and coffees and teas.